Today on the Bander Says Podcast, I will be addressing a whole heap ton of audio-related questions, so go ahead and stick around. Alright, so we are starting right at the What You Had to Say segment, and last week I got a comment asking, do dynamic microphones really pick up less background sounds though? Really? I'm not convinced. I went from a cheap condenser to the Rode Procaster, and when the levels were equal, I still hear all the background noise just as well. And other than differences in frequency range and response, how would they pick up background less? Can this be tested and or proven, or is it just a big conspiracy or whatever? Then there is a triangle and an eye, and it says, that's supposed to be the Illuminati. Alex, thank you very much for the question, and I did initially intend to do a very quick test, comparing a dynamic versus a condenser, but at best that would have been anecdotal and at worst it would have been disingenuous. I feel as though if I am going to make a video on this topic, it needs to be thorough, it needs to be repeatable, it needs to be as scientifically accurate as possible, so I really wasn't too comfortable doing a quick down and dirty example or demonstration of two microphones. That doesn't show us the overarching idea of dynamic versus condenser. I would need to do broadcast dynamics versus studio condensers. I would have to do handheld dynamics versus handheld condensers. I would have to do ribbons versus so on and so forth. I would have to do a series of testing that would probably take a month to come up with any solid scientific data showing how and what the differences are in condenser versus dynamic. So that is why I did not create the video which I said I was going to do with a quick test of those two types of microphones being compared because it's not doable in a week and I want to do the topic justice. I have heard this from multiple microphone companies saying, yeah, dynamics do. I've also heard from microphone companies, no, dynamics don't. So it is a contentious topic, not even between folks who use audio gear, but it seems also between audio companies. <laughs> but because I am a dope, if anybody has a suggestion on a testing rig that I can make that would allow me to repeatedly test a microphone's pickup on axis at zero degrees, at 90 degrees, and 180 degrees, at distances of 6 inches, 12 inches, 24, 48, etc. So we can get a good idea of how each of the microphones, dynamic and condenser, perform in that situation. That would be amazing. If you have that idea, let me know in the comments or go ahead and send me an email, askbandrew at gmail.com. I would love to do this properly. And then I will make a big 50 minute long video and I, will, I feel as though if I did this, I would have to upload the audio samples and let people hear exactly what I recorded so they could verify the results as well. So Alex, thank you very much for asking the question. I didn't make the video. I will. It's going to take a while and it needs to be scientifically accurate. So thank you very much. Next, we have what I have been testing. And this is the Mojave MA201 FET. I don't know if this microphone is still being made. It's not for sale anywhere that I can see, so I'm not sure if it's still available, but this concludes the run on the show, and I really enjoyed this microphone because it adds this weight to my voice. My voice is not particularly bassy. It is not particularly authoritative. It is weak sounding. It is harsh sounding, and this microphone just adds frequencies in all the right places for my voice and i really enjoyed it i would love to know what you think of it you can leave me a comment you can send me an email i also did two songs with this i recorded two songs on bandrew plays on youtube just search bandrew plays and there are the songs that i have done over the last two months i think have the microphone used listed in the title so you can see that or you can look at the playlists for the microphone so this concludes the Mojave MA201 FET. I am so excited for the microphone we're going to use next week. I may be the only podcaster who is using this next microphone, maybe even this style of microphone, but I can't be certain of that because I don't know what microphones everybody uses. Okay, now let's jump to my favorite part of the show, the Ask Bandrew segment. Ask 
Greetings and welcome to the Ask Bandrew segment. If you have a question that you want answered, head over to askbandrew.com. You can send in an audio or a video submission, or you can send in an email. There are instructions on how to do all of those things. I personally prefer audio and video because I don't have to read them, and it gives folks listening a break from my voice. So first off, we will start with an audio submission from Bruno. Take it away, Bruno. Hey, Ben Drew. Um, Bruno from Brazil, and I have a UMC 22 from Behringer, and currently I'm using the Samsung Q7, but I like to get a microphone to record acoustic guitar, and I think the Nate King B would be good enough for both um, vocals and the acoustic guitar. If you have any other recommendation, I'd like to hear that. Um, but I was wondering if my interface is good enough for me to um, use the Nick King Bay or should I upgrade the interface as well? Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Bruno, what up, what up, what up? To answer your question, here is a sample. This is the Neat King B running into the Behringer UM2, which is a lower quality interface than the UMC22. I have my gain set at around 11 o'clock, and I am hitting around negative 12 to negative 9 dB on my meters. I will, of course, boost this a little bit in post. I won't do any kind of compression, any kind of noise reduction, or any kind of post-processing. This will just be a raw recording. So to answer the question, yes, the Neat King B can be driven by your Behringer interface. The only real time that the more affordable options are going to pose an issue is if you're driving a low output microphone like the SM7B. In that case, you would have to drive the gain to near 100%, if not to 100%, and that will introduce a really loud noise floor. So that is when the shortcomings of the more affordable options really come into play. With most condenser microphones, you're not going to run into many issues. And I'm going to mention this a little bit later in the episode, but I did a video on when you should upgrade your audio interface or your microphone. And I do a demonstration on whether or not you can tell there's a difference between the UM2, the 18i20 or 2i2, and the Universal Audio X8. And for condenser microphones, it really is negligible, especially if you're uploading it and compressing it and dumping it on YouTube or to a podcast at 128 kilobits per second MP3. Thank you very much for the question, Bruno. Appreciate you. Hope that helped. Best of luck on your recording. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Bruno. I appreciate you. Let's jump to the second audio submission. Hi, Andrew. Following a lot of your uh, videos, I've recently bought the uh, Rode NT1 mic and uh, the audio interface that goes with it. This has obviously led to much better quality audio from uh, from that setup, but I'm now finding that the uh, Rode Video Micro on my camera, as well as my lav mics, uh, are a completely different quality of audio. Uh, what, if anything, would you recommend doing to kind of even those up? Uh, should I start introducing some kind of noise into the NT1 setup, or should I seek to reduce the noise or post-process on the other two microphones uh, to make them try to match to what the NT1 is, maybe using some EQ and that kind of thing. Thanks very much. Love the podcast. That is an excellent question. How can you make your lav microphone and your shotgun microphone sound like the NT1? I don't think you're going to be able to match them perfectly. And I think that degrading the quality of the NT1 should be the very last resort. That should be the last option that you have. First thing I would do is try to add some EQ to the lavalier microphone as well as the shotgun microphone to try to get a similar tonality out of them. And then I would also add a denoise and a de-reverb to try to get similar characteristics there as well. But as I say, whenever I mention denoise or de-reverb, those are somewhat dangerous plugins, meaning it is very easy to overdo it and end up destroying the quality of your recording. It sounds funky. It sounds bad. So you need to be very subtle with your 
application of those different plugins and that processing because D-Reverb, D-Noise are very, very helpful, but very easy to go overboard and completely destroy your recording. I would also look at your microphone placement. If you have your shotgun microphone on top of your camera four feet away from you, there's no chance in hell that it's going to sound anything like an NT1 with you speaking close to the microphone. So in that instance, I would put the shotgun microphone on a boom arm and put it right out of frame, just above your head, maybe a foot away, and that will get you much better quality sound and give you a much better signal to background noise and signal to noise floor ratio. So you would have a much cleaner and much better sounding recording and it would be much easier to manipulate that to make it sound like an NT1 as opposed to the shotgun microphone being camera top four feet away from you. As far as lav microphones, I am no expert in this field. I have only done or used a few different lavs and they are all relatively cheap and affordable. I would defer to sound speeds on YouTube. He is the professional audio guy. He uses lavs on film sets and he knows what he's doing there. I imagine you could with microphone placement get a much better quality and get it closer to the NT1. It's going to be hard to match an omnidirectional lav mic that is beneath your chin. It's going to be hard to match that to the NT1 though. But with some EQ, with some noise removal, with some D-reverb, you might be able to match them a little bit more closely and make the switch between the three different audio sources much less jarring. But are you going to get them the same? No. And the last resort should be degrading the good audio quality that you have. Thank you very much for that question. Next, we have an email from Jorge, and he says, Hi, Bandrew. I asked in one of your videos without any luck, so I guess I you have a lot of comments to read. I work in a very noisy environment. My studio slash office is untreated, and I want to make a podcast. Someone told me I should use a dynamic microphone. I saw your video of the PGA48, and I wanted to ask if this microphone would be a good choice for podcasting in my actual environment. I presently have a Samson C01 condenser mic with a noise floor around negative 50 dB with everything set up. Thanks. All right, Bandrew from the past here, and thank you so much for the email, Jorge. I appreciate you. I am speaking into the Samson C01 XLR microphone right now. It is connected to the Behringer UM2. My gain is set at 12 o'clock at noon, straight up and down. I will not do any kind of post-processing. I will boost it in post to make it more listenable, but no other processing will be thrown on this audio sample. And in order to demonstrate the background noise rejection of the C01 versus the PGA48, I am going to play some royalty-free New York City sounds, one-hour traffic, comma, subway, and human sounds, one hour. And I will just continue to speak into the C01, and then I'll, I will switch to the PGA48 so you can hear how that works out. So let me go ahead and continue to play this. Okay, we have traffic noises going on in the background. I hope you're having a wonderful day right now. I have the rear of the C01 pointed directly at my computer, so it is getting the most rejection as it can. Let me go ahead and jump over to the PGA48 so you can hear the difference. Okay, and now I have switched over to the Shure PGA48. I increased my gain to three o'clock on the interface. I have the rear of the microphone pointed at my computer where the sounds are coming from. And you be the judge. Do you hear the C01 or the PGA48 rejecting more background noise? What do you hear? Let me know in the comments down below. Shoot me an email. Jorge, I hope this was a useful demonstration for you so you can hear how each of these microphones performs at rejecting noise. All righty, let's jump to audio submission number three. Hey, Bandrew. Hope all is well. I am hoping you could provide some mic recommendations for bass singers. There does not seem to be a lot of content addressing this, and most of the samples I find for mics are demonstrated by more mid-range singers. Thank you for all the content you put out, and stay safe. Ooh, mic recommendations for bass singers. First off, what a bassy and authoritative voice. Your voice is so good. I want your voice. It sounds incredible. 
I don't know any bass singers, so I am not personally able to provide any demos for you. Normally I would because that would be the most helpful thing I could do. So the recommendation that I would have is avoid any mics that have too much proximity effect. So when you are watching reviews, regardless of the tone of the speaker, pay attention to how much proximity effect there is. When they get close to the microphone, how much of a boost to the bass is there? Because if you have a super bassy voice and there is a crap ton of proximity effect, that can get muddy very, very quickly. As far as some recommendations, I can't remember this guy's name. It's Jeff or something. He is a bass singer with some choral group, and he has a YouTube video about singing really, really low. And in that video, it appears that he is using the Shure KSM 32 or the 44A. I'm leaning towards the 32. And the way that he uses it, he has the microphone maybe three feet away from him. So it eliminates a lot of the proximity effect from that. Therefore, I think what would be important is either have a really good room, a well-treated room that you're recording in, so you can place the microphone far away from you and eliminate the majority of the proximity effect so it doesn't get overly bassy, or look for condenser microphones that have a few different high-pass filter options on them so you can really fine-tune the lower frequencies which is where a lot of information in your voice is going to be. With that criteria, the first microphone that comes to mind is the C414 XLS or the XL2. The XL2 is the vocal version of the microphone and it has a bit more treble and air and that may be very beneficial if you have a very bassy and dark voice. And it has three options for high pass filters, 40, 80, and 160 hertz, so you can really fine tune that. But if you don't like the tone, the bright, maybe bordering on harsh sound of the CK4, CK414, the C414, the OC818 from Austrian Audio has a very similar setup. It has three high pass filter options. I believe the exact same frequencies, 40, 80, or 160 and that may be a good option as well other than that i can't really offer too much advice i don't have any experience micing up people with extremely bassy voices i will link the bass singer guy jeff that i mentioned in the show notes i will also link to a gentleman's youtube channel named anton brown he is an absolute character he doesn't just do microphone reviews, but he has quite a few handheld microphones that he has reviewed on his channel, and he has a very bassy voice. So that could give you some idea of how certain microphones perform for somebody with a super bassy voice. Thank you so much for the question. Wonderful, wonderful voice. I look forward to hearing what you end up landing on and how it works for you. And when you do get it, because as you pointed out, there are not many folks with bassy voices who are reviewing microphones, record a video, upload it to YouTube, help people out. That would be incredible. Thank you so much. Amazing question. Let's go to another audio video voice submission thingy. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, how do you really, how do you really compare the tonalities and color of a microphone when I've only really seen you in a video with the Sony MDR 7506 on head. I was just wondering if you have something like Sennheiser HD 600 in the background and never told us or something, because I'm not going to lie, the Sonys are pretty neutral, yes, but they they are not flat. Not, I mean, HD 600 aren't flat as well, but... I was just wondering if you had more reference points as of headphones. Goodbye. And thanks for answer. Thank you very, very much for that question. What an excellent, excellent question. That is true. You do see me wearing the 7506s most of the time to sound like pay money wubby. Ah! That, that <laughs> I apologize. I use the... 7506s with and without something called Sonarworks 
Sonarworks will flatten out a headphone and make them much more neutral. So that will be a baseline for me because I really do understand and I am familiar with the 7506s. I then have the Neumann KH80 studio monitors here. I will listen to microphones through those. Then in my living room, I have the Sennheiser HD 650s, which I am also very, very familiar with. I've been using them for maybe a year at this point, and I use those for all of my casual listening. So I'll listen through those headphones, and then I will listen through my iMac speakers. I'll listen through my laptop speakers. I'll listen through my phone speakers to get as many different playback systems that I am familiar with and really try to understand what each microphone is. So although you see me recording just with the 7506s because I think they are great tracking headphones, I don't just use these headphones to monitor microphones and come up with my opinion on microphones. I listen through multiple playback systems that I have become very familiar with to try to get the best understanding of each of the microphones I'm talking about. I hope that answers your question. I hope that provides some insight. Thank you very much for asking it. Next, we have a email from Josh C. Liston. He says, just a quick question, Bandrew. Is there a technical reason why the SM7B and to a slightly lesser degree, the RE20 needs so much gain compared to other microphones? Are they getting some benefit from requiring so much gain? Cheers, Josh Liston, podcast host for Punching Side sideways with Josh Liston and tips of the slung. To answer the question very briefly, it has to do with a technical limitation. There are two main types of microphones. There are more, but two main types of microphones on the market. Condensers, dynamics. Condensers require 48 volts of phantom power. That power actually powers the internal components of the microphone, which does include amplification and it also charges the capsule, which has a charged backplate, and the diaphragm has a coating of metal. So as the diaphragm moves back and forth with the movement of the air, it causes a voltage between the backplate and that diaphragm, and that creates the electric signal of your voice. And then the internal components of the condenser amplifies that as well. Because of all of that stuff going on, that's why condensers have self-noise. Then dynamics, they don't require any kind of phantom power. They have a permanently charged magnet in them. And that means they're passive and they have a much lower output because those magnets are so weak. There are some companies who have started to use something called neodymium magnets, which if I am not mistaken, is a different type of magnet compared to what was used in the 70s and 80s and those are much stronger magnets so it provides a hotter output but from the microphones that i have heard using the neodymium magnets electro voice is a big fan of those it seems to have a little bit more of a harsh sound and to be completely clear i am not saying that neodymium magnets cause that sound it may just be they design microphones that are harsh sounding that also implement neodymium magnets so i don't know what the cause of that is but it is a technical limitation of dynamic microphones. They are much more sturdy than a lot of condensers, although you have started to see condenser technology come quite a ways, and that's why you ha have quite a few handheld condensers because they have found ways to make condensers extremely sturdy. So just a sign of the times, I guess. They have magnets, they are sturdier, and they could handle a beating. They weren't designed to be used in wide open, beautiful sounding studios, and they have weak magnets. I don't know if that's the answer you wanted, but that's the answer you're getting from me. <laughs> Josh, thank you very much for the great question. Hope that helped you. Hope that gave you the info you were looking for. Let's jump to one last voice submission. Take it away, A.A. Ron. Hey, Bandrew. Aaron here. I've got what I hope is a really simple question. Is there an appreciable difference between the different classes of audio interfaces? I'm not talking about features, just the simple quality of the sound being sent to the DAW. If there is, at what price point or class does the difference become apparent? Okay, that was the important question. 
I'm also interested in what equipment you have in that rack mount to your left, and what in there you actually regularly use. Thanks, and keep rocking that beanie. Thank you very much for that question, and I actually addressed this exact question in my video, when should you upgrade your audio interface or your microphone? I will link that video in the show notes and episode notes right down below this video and in your podcatcher. And in there, all you need to do is watch the first three minutes before a shocking reveal. It's like an, no, it's not like an M. Night Shyamalan movie because there's no twist. It's, it's, it's an expo, expose, a, it's something. You'll understand. Just watch the first three minutes of that video. I'll link it. But to answer it here, there is a difference, absolutely. However, most people will not notice any difference, especially if you are uploading to YouTube or you are compressing your podcast down to a 128 kilobits per second MP3. You're losing a lot of that information and a lot of that benefit that you would get from a $2,800 interface or a $200 interface compared to a $30 interface. But I do think that $200 is the level where most people will be fine with that interface forevermore unless the interface breaks or they do end up needing some additional features. I hope that helps. But now let's talk about what's in this rack that I have behind me. First thing on top, I have my Marshall DSL-15H. It is a guitar amplifier. I hate it. I think it sounds like trash. I use external pedals to make it sound good. <laughs> Not a big fan of that. Then I have a power conditioner to power all of the stuff in the rack. I have a spacer because the next item in the rack gets hot. It needs some ventilation. Beneath that, I have the Universal Audio X8 audio interface, which goes over Thunderbolt into my Mac. It has DSP processing, it has four preamps and four line inputs, and you can run line into all of them as well. It has two hi Z inputs on the front for channel one and two. So if I want to do any kind of amp simulators, plug right into that. Then the second rack, I have the Arteria 8 Pre, and this is an eight channel audio interface and standalone preamp. And I use it as an ADAT expansion to the Universal Audio X8. So that turns the X8 from a four channel preamp interface into a 12 channel preamp interface because I can expand the preamps to include the eight that are in the arteria. Then beneath that, I have the Warm Audio WA73 preamp EQ. And lastly, the Universal Audio LA610 mark ii which is a tube compressor with an or a tube preamp with an optical compressor as far as if i use them i use the oh i completely forgot i have the focus right 18 i20 in here as well that's a audio interface you know all about that same as the focus right 2i2 as far as what i use in here i use the power conditioner every day use the Universal Audio X8 every day. I use the Focusrite every single time I do a review because it has the same sound characteristics, same performance as the 2i2, but it clears stuff off of my desk. And if I need to compare a bunch of microphones simultaneously, I have eight preamps on the Focusrite to do so. And I don't have to risk recording twice and having some variables that screw up a comparison. The Arteria, I very rarely use that because I don't have a need for 12 channels. It's there in case I need it. And it's just an incredible set of preamps. Arteria is top tier preamps. I'm blown away by what they do. Then the WA73 EQ and the LA610, I just use those for tomorrow's video on podcastage, but not too frequently do they get turned on and used as much as they should. When I start doing more music stuff, I am going to start utilizing a lot more of the stuff that I have. It's just finding the time to actually dive into that world. I hope that answers your question, and thank you so much for asking it. I appreciate you, A.A. Ron. Thank you so much. And I think that is actually going to wrap up 
for this week's episode of the BSP. Thank you so much for coming by. Thank you so much for listening and watching and just being a wonderful human. Don't you dare effing forget that. You are an amazing human being. I love you. Other people love you. You are incredible. You are an asset to this world. People like you. People love you. You're amazing. How cheesy can I get? I appreciate you. <laughs> Until next week, I hope you have us an amazing, an excellent, an incredible Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Next Sunday, I will talk at you. And stay safe. Stay away from people. Trust no one. The truth is out there. I love you. Bye. This has been a Geeks Rising production. Your executive producer is Bandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.